Okay, so um, I'm Katie Adams. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm one of the first year pulmonary critical care fellows. Katie Adams. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll be talking today about high flow oxygen with respiratory failure. And uh, there we go. So I don't have any financial disclosures or conflicts of interest. Are you sure? Yes, quite sure. Quite sure. Uh, <laughs> so today our objectives will be to cover some conventional oxygen therapy methods. We'll talk about the high flow nasal cannula system and then the physiologic effects of high flow nasal oxygen. We'll talk about initiating, weaning, and monitoring patients while they're on high flow nasal oxygen. We'll talk about some indications and contraindications uh, for using the high flow nasal oxygen. And then we'll talk about some uh, studies out there that look at the efficacy of high flow nasal oxygen and um, do a quick conclusion. So conventional oxygen therapy, just briefly, we'll talk about our low flow oxygen delivery. So traditionally we have our nasal cannula that almost every patient is put on in the hospital. This is between one to six liters per minute of oxygen. And as you can see on the um, screen, there's the, flow, the theoretical flow rate um, with one liter to six liters. Now, um, this is 100% oxygen that's being delivered to the patient through the nasal cannula. And um, if you go above four liters, um, the patient should have this um, humidified via the bubble humidifier. Now, this is a very variable um, oxygen delivery as far as the FiO2 goes because you have a lot of oxygen dilution. So when your patient is breathing, say they're a little bit tachypnic, taking large tidal volumes, they'll have a lot of dilution by um, air entering the nasal passages and the oropharynx um, from the room air. So the FiO2 is very variable with this. So they may or may not be getting the four liters, the 0.36 FiO2, um, if they're very tachypnic on that level. <clears throat> the next one uh, of our low flow oxygen delivery methods is the simple face mask. This one can go up to 10 liters per minute with um, a corresponding 0.6 FiO2. Again, it's very variable, again, as far as the um, FiO2 that's delivered for similar reasons with the oxygen dilution. And it may or may not be comfortable with, for patients. It's kind of just like a temporary means for oxygenation. Maybe a patient's uh, having a nosebleed or something, they were on the nasal cannula and you put them on this temporarily. Then we have our non rebreather masks. We have a partial non rebreather and then the 100% non rebreather. So both of these masks look similar to this picture that's up here. The one that's up there is the 100% um, non-rebreather because it has a one-way valve that allows air to escape but not to enter into the mask. And the partial non-rebreathers have vents. Now these have a oxygen reservoir bag that should be insufflated and this allows the patient when they take a large breath of air to get air from that um, oxygen reservoir instead of sucking in a lot of ambient air. And when you are putting patients on these, the flow of oxygen needs to be at least six liters per minute to ensure that it's in a buildup of CO2 within the mask. And the partial non-rebreather can go up to 10 liters and the 100% non-rebreather can go up to 15. For the next one, this is the Venturi mask and then the green cannula. So the Venturi mask is thought to be um, more specific as far as how much FiO2 you can deliver to a patient. Um, it has the traditional face mask with the vents, and then there's these adapters, or there's a single adapter that you can like twist or just change out the adapters. The different colors have different um, FiO2s and liters per minute that can be delivered. And then the green cannula can go up to 15 liters per minute, and it works with a humidifier. So the high flow nasal cannula um, system, there's a lot of different uh, companies out there that make it. So you'll see it by like Airvo or Vapotherm or Optiflow, but they all have a very similar mechanism and um, I'll just explain it, um, the bare bones of it essentially. The one up here on uh, the right is the Airvo and then the other one is the Optiflow. The Vapotherm only goes up to 50 liters per minute and the other two go up to 60. So this is kind of a, a bare bones diagram of the um, high flow nasal cannula. I did get this off of a paper that was published, which I have cited at the end of my presentation. So this is a, um, these are just some, the main parts. You have your flow meter, you have an air oxygen blender, 
you have <clears throat> the humidifier, the heated circuit, and then the nasal cannula system, and then there's the temperature sensor that is um, here uh, between the nasal cannula and the uh, inspiratory circuit. So essentially what happens is you have an air intake and then the oxygen intake. This is then delivered to your air oxygen blender. This blended oxygen, depending on what you have your flow rate set at and what your SiO2 is set at, um, is then delivered to this water chamber. And the air is heated and there's like a, a vapor that's created. It's generally heated to 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit. Uh, so then this vapor is then transferred to this heated inspiratory circuit and actually has a wire in it to con continuously heat it and prevent condensation from building up from the vapor. And then um, it goes through this temperature sensor and then it's delivered to the patient via the nasal prompt. So talking about the physiologic effects of high flow oxygen and why it seems to be very effective at treating patients with hypoxia. Um, first, talking about the nasal prongs, this is a, I mean, I'm sure we've all come in contact with these. Um, they're like a soft rubbery nasal cannula that has a larger um, prongs than our traditional nasal cannulas. And they actually have little sticky things that stick to the patient's face. And when you're going to put this on a patient, you need to make sure you are ensuring a good size. So theoretically, the um, nasal opening should be occluded by at least 50% with the nasal prompt that you put in. With the adults, there's like um, a small, a medium, and a large, and then there's the pediatric sizes, obviously. So if you have a good fit, then it will have a better um, seal. Patients generally tolerate this nasal cannula system a little bit better than our traditional nasal cannulas because of these reasons. Like we talked about, the air is uh, heated and there's this vapor that's warmed and humidified. And just given this, it makes it so it's more comfortable for patients. However, it does more than that. It improves your mucociliary function and it helps facilitate uh, secretions. And then you don't have to have this extra energy expenditure by yourself heating um, this air that's being delivered into your body, especially at those very high flow rates, and then you don't have the excess, the insensible water losses with that as well if you have to humidify that yourself. The, so studies show that it's the humidification and the warmth in the air and then the flow rates that actually help the most with this um, oxygen delivery, and the flow rates do a lot of different things. So first of all, the flow that you can deliver is very high. So patients who are in a lot of respiratory stress, they could go up to needing like an inspiratory flow of like 120 liters per minute, but those patients probably wouldn't be on this device. But if a patient's in distress and say they're requiring 40 liters per minute of flow, you can deliver that and more. And that means that you are guaranteeing that this patient won't have that washout of, of oxygen all of the air that they're going to be inspiring will be that set FiO2 that you have. Um, and so you don't have that variable um, FiO2 that you see with your other oxygen delivery methods. The other thing is because you're giving so much flow and it exceeds what the patient maybe even needs, there is this dead space washout that they talk about. And this specifically happens in the upper airways, but can happen some in the lower airways. Now, this will theoretically increase your PaO2 with the washout of CO2, and it will improve your alveolar arterial gradient and improve oxygenation. Patients, when you put them on this, tend to have less work of breathing. They are more comfortable. Their respiratory rate usually drops and if you have their flow at a high enough rate, and their tidal volume will also drop. And across the board, most patients report that they have less dyspnea when they're placed on this. With the PEEP effect that um, is talked about some, so the, you have this theoretical PEEP effect and you can't, you shouldn't think about it as though you're getting PEEP because you have high flows going in. It's really that you have high flows going into your nares and if you were to exhale out of your nose with your mouth closed, then you have this kind of splinting effect and these higher pressures in your nares and your nasal pharynx. And they have measured these pressures in studies, and it shows that it's about one centimeter of water for each 10 liters of flow, and it can go up to about five centimeters of water. But again, this is measured in your nasal pharynx, not in your, your lower airways. So you're still breathing on your own. You still have negative pressure with the diaphragm uh, being involved in your inspiration. So it's not really a true peep in that way. However, 
there was a study that was published, um, and I think I have it in a couple slides, but they put patients on high clinical cannula and they did echo and they looked at their IVC and there was inspiratory collapse with the high clinical cannula. So maybe it is providing a little bit of peak to the lower airways as well. And then additionally, because you have these higher pressures in your nasal pharynx, um, it helps actually dilate them, and this decreases the upper airway resistance and improves the flow dynamics. So when we're initiating leaning therapy and monitoring patients on high flow nasal cannula, uh, when I was looking into this, there were some sources that said you can start at you know lower rates of flow and lower FiO2. So I think the main protocol that I saw said that you should start high. So you start at the 60 liters and the 100% of FiO2 and you have your temperature set for the 37 degrees Celsius. Now, to determine your flow, you need to uh, meet your patient's inspiratory flow rate. Um, and to do that, you just kind of look at their uh, respiratory rate and see when they're becoming more comfortable with whatever flow you have it set at. Now, you obviously will adjust your SpO2 based on the patient's, or your FiO2 mm -hmm. based on the, your, what your full SpO2 is with your specific case. And you want to monitor the patient's comfort, especially with the vapor temperature and make sure that the patient is comfortable with whatever you have it set at. There's this um, ROX index, uh, Roca et al. published this in 2018 as a way of determining whether or not your patient is going to succeed on high flow nasal cannula or if there's a high likelihood that they will fail and need to be intubated. So this ROX index is the SpO2 divided by SiO2 and that is then divided by your respiratory rate. So with this uh, higher number is usually better. The cutoff that they had was 4.88 and they measured it at different increments after you initiate high flow nasal oxygen. Um, and if your ROX is decreasing um, after you've initiated this over time, then it may indicate that hypo-nasal oxygen is not a good option for this patient. You have to think about maybe intubation or other modalities for oxygen delivery. Now, when you're weeding FiO2, the goal should be, you know, if you have your patient comfortable at a set flow rate, you should decrease the FiO2 first. And if you can get the FiO2 to less than 40%, then you start coming down on your flow. And that's usually by five liters per minute increments that you decrease this. And when you get your flow to less than 15 liters per minute, then you can consider transitioning to conventional oxygen therapy, such as the green cannula. Just to add a point, uh, yeah. in the rock. Mm -hmm. So the, as you notice that we are using the SpO2 divided by FI2, which usually in, in our sick patient, we use the uh, PO2 divided by FI2, is that right? So that's our rate PS ratio. Mm -hmm. In this situation, they studied the, the correlation between the SPO2 and FI2. And when they did the ROX index, they found that the SPO2 divided by FI2, if it's like uh, 300, uh, sort of 200, I think 35 or 30, that's equivalent to the 200 of the PS ratio. And the 310 is equivalent to the 300 of the biggest ratio. So you can, by doing this, you can know how like, the severity of your patient is wrong mm, okay. comparing yeah. to your respiratory rate. And the idea behind it is that your respiratory, like, if your respiratory rate starts going down mm -hmm. and your uh, ratio is going up, that gives you a clue that it's improving. Yeah. And that's why the, the higher the ratio, the more clue that this patient will be able to get out of this without the uh, uh, intubation. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So when do we use um, high flow nasal oxygen? So a lot of studies that I saw were mostly focused on acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And a lot of the studies that I'll talk about have to do with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, most studies do show that there's decreased breathing frequency when you put these patients on high flow, they endorse improved comfort, and there's a significant improvement in the SpO2 that's reported. And another notable thing is that patients are very compliant with this. Um, so you're going to have better outcome just based on that. Patients usually do not ask to be taken off of it because of discomfort. There's also a role for high flow oxygen in the post extubation um, period. So there are studies out there that show that if you can, in patients who are at like intermediate 
risk from needing reintubation, you can put them on high flow nasal oxygen and they will have lower need to go on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation and also less uh, frequently are reintubated. And then this is something kind of interesting that I, I don't think I rarely ever see happen is this peri-intubation period. So if you have a patient that's not currently on high flow oxygen, you theoretically can put them on high flow nasal cannula for three to seven minutes prior to intubation. And then because it's a nasal cannula device, you leave that device in place when you are intubating the patient with multiple tries. And then obviously if a patient is already on high flow nasal cannula and you think they need to be intubated, you can just leave that on and running during the perioperative, during the intubation period. Now this, uh, uh, in well, I think that's how you say it, um, at all, they did a study on this and they showed that in ICU patients, um, when they compared this with bag mask ventilation, where you then take that off the patient and then you try to intubate versus leaving the high flow cannula on, um, the SpO2s with the high flow cannula was close to 100%, whereas it dropped into the low 90s when they did the bag mask ventilation. So this shows that it may actually improve patient safety when you're intubating in the ICU with the high flow nasal cannula on. And then some, there's some patients out there that would benefit from using high flow nasal cannula if they're at risk for becoming hypoxic postoperatively. Patients who've had major thoracic surgeries or major abdominal surgeries often will benefit from this. And then we see a lot of this where you have patients who just don't tolerate a face mask, whether it's a BiPAP, CPAP, um, even AVAPs, they just don't tolerate it or they're very claustrophobic. And some of these patients, depending on your clinical scenario, can benefit from going on the high flow oxygen. We also see a lot with patients who are DNR, DNI uh, families, uh, they're profoundly hypoxic. You can put them on this and at least give the patient and family a little bit of time to make a decision whether or not they're going to pursue comfort care or have more aggressive measures. And then <clears throat> there is theoretically, um, you could use this in cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And this is the study I had mentioned earlier. Roca et al. did this study where they had these patients in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and they put them on high flow nasal cannula, and then they did an ultrasound, and it showed that there's this inspiratory collapse of the IBC. So <clears throat> theoretically, there is some peep in lower airways, and it may benefit patients who are in this uh, pulmonary edema. So when do we not use high flow nasal oxygen? <clears throat> I mean, pretty straightforward. If the patient has trauma to the nasal pharynx or they recently had a nasal pharyngeal surgery or they have blocked nasal passages, you would not be able to do this. Also, you are breathing on your own in this scenario. So you can't, if you have central apnea, um, <clears throat> this would not be a good option for you either. And then decreased level of consciousness, it's also not shown to be very safe in this scenario. <clears throat> With hypercaptic respiratory failure, so, um, this would not obviously be your go-to method for patients who have uh, strictly hypercaptic respiratory failure. Um, that being said, their, Miller et al. did report a case where they successfully treated a patient with hypercaptic respiratory failure who wasn't tolerating non-invasive ventilation. Whether this is because of the dead space washout that we talked about or not, um, is I'm not sure, but for the most part, patients have decreased minute ventilation when you put them on this, so it's probably not the best like go-to method for um, hypercaptic respiratory failure. And then there's um, this patients who are rapidly deteriorating. If you see a patient and they're in severe uh, respiratory failure, profoundly hypoxic, and you think they're going to need intubation, but you want to kind of hold off and put them on high flow, that is not a good option. So uh, Kang et al. did a study and they showed that these patients were inevitably, these patients were need, going to need to be intubated. And then you waited and kind of did this band-aid with high flow nasal cannula and eventually intubated them. These patients actually had increased IT mortality and they also um, had a fewer ventilator pre -day. So it may cause harm if you delay intubation in these uh, critically uh, ill patients. And then, the other thing is patients with like underlying sleep disorders or um, if you excavate somebody and they um, have obesity hypoventilation syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea, um, it's probably smart to go to other modalities initially for those patients, whether it's BiPAP or CPAP. Um, but their um, McGinney at all, they did find that they were able to overcome upper airway obstruction with high flow nasal cannula. 
um, and it also reduced their AHI. So theoretically, it can work, but I don't think that should be the uh, go-to method for these patients either. So this is just um, a few studies that uh, compared high flow oxygen versus conventional oxygen therapy. I'm going to mess up some of these names, so I apologize. So Baldomero um, et al. So this is a meta-analysis. This investigated all-cause mortality, intubation rates, and hospital acquired pneumonia in patients that were in acute respiratory failure, and they were on high flow, um, non-invasive, and conventional oxygen therapy. And this was a this was included 29 randomized controls trials. And they did find that in comparison to conventional oxygen therapy, the high flow nasal oxygen had reduced intubation rates. Um, and again, these patients were more comfortable than with the conventional oxygen therapy. Uh, Ferreo et al., they also performed a, <clears throat> a study that compared non-invasive oxygen strategies on all-cause mortality in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. This was a meta-analysis that had a lot of patients, about 3,800 patients, and again, they compared um, conventional oxygen therapy and high flow nasal oxygen. And with the high flow nasal oxygen, there was a lower risk of endotracheal intubation, but there was no change in mortality in either of the groups. Um, Aspina et al. also performed a study that had, it was a randomized trial, 220 patients. This was high flow nasal oxygen and conventional oxygen therapy in COVID-19, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And again, they did show that there's lower intubation rates if you use the high flow nasal oxygen in comparison to conventional oxygen therapy. And there was actually a reduced time to clinical improvement by about four days in that study. Uh, but again, no change in mortality in either group. The SOHO COVID clinical trial, this was um, patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure, again, with COVID-19. Um, pretty big study, 700 patients, about and they again showed the lower intubation rates with the high flow oxygen versus a non rebreather mask, but again, no change in mortality. So it's kind of, it's harder to find direct comparisons to NIV and high flow nasal oxygen, but um, there is this Hennebot uh, clinical trial that was done, which they had two groups of patients. There were 110 IT patients with COVID-19 hypoxemic respiratory failure, either moderate or severe respiratory failure. And they were either put in a group where they were put on a helmet, non-invasive ventilation for 48 hours, and then um, followed by high flow nasal oxygen or just placed on high flow nasal oxygen alone. And um, the rate of endotracheal intubations was a lot higher actually um, with the patients who were just on the high flow nasal oxygen. So the helmet was actually superior in this study, but there was no change in mortality. The recovery RS trial, this one again was with COVID-19, hypoxemic respiratory failure, and it was a pretty large study too, about 1,300 patients. This compared conventional oxygen therapy, CPAP, and high flow nasal oxygen. And they again showed that the non-invasive ventilation with CPAP had reduced rates of intubation compared to conventional oxygen therapy and high flow. And actually, contrary to previous the previous studies on the last slide, they did not see a change in intubation rates between conventional oxygen therapy and high flow oxygen. And then lastly, the Ferrali trial. This one was a multi-center trial. It enrolled 310 patients. These had non-hypercapnic acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And again, they compared non-invasive conventional oxygen and high flow. Um, and they actually did not show a difference in the intubation rates or ventilator free days, but in a secondary analysis, they did see a 90-day mortality benefit for the high flow nasal cannula group. So just a few misconceptions that some of us may have heard. Um, so mouth freezers won't benefit from high flow nasal cannula. This is not true. Um, they actually show that patients with uh, who are mouth breathers actually oxygenate very well with high flow nasal oxygen. That's probably because of the oxygen uh, reservoir in the nasal pharynx. And so this should not uh, stop you from placing a patient on high flow nasal cannula or even just encouraging somebody who's mouth breathing to close their mouth and breathe through their nose. It, so they still oxygenate very well. Um, then there's this risk, that this um, concern that because this is an aerosolizing um, delivery of oxygen, there's a risk for um, uh, healthcare worker infections. 
and they actually compared high flow oxygen, conventional oxygen therapy, and NIV, and they did not see an increased transmission in high flow nasal cannula. So it shouldn't be that big of a concern. If you are very concerned about it, um, what they recommend is that you place a surgical mask on the patient's face after the high flow nasal cannula is in place, and the patient seem to do fine with this, and no, it does not in increase your PCO2. So that's another option. And then just because we're providing humidified, warmed um, gas does not prevent epistaxis. So these patients still often will have nosebleeds, and it's something to uh, keep in mind when you're treating them, especially with the very high flow rates. So um, some just general conclusions. Um, most studies show that in comparison to conventional oxygen therapy, uh, there are reduction in intubation rates in patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure who are treated with high flow nasal oxygen. And again, in comparison to conventional oxygen therapy, high flow nasal cannula used in the post um, extubation setting can help decrease our need for non invasive positive pressure ventilation and, and reduce our rates of re intubation. And it should be considered as an alternative method if your um, patient is failing conventional oxygen therapy. It's very well tolerated by patients. Patients don't ask to have it taken off because it's uncomfortable for them. And the other thing to keep in mind is if you have a rapidly deteriorating patient, don't try to just hold off with the high flow nasal oxygen. If the patient needs to be intubated, they should be and to prevent uh, worse outcomes. And uh, most studies do not show, um, an exception to maybe one or two, they do not show an increase in mortality in comparison to conventional oxygen therapy with high flow nasal oxygen. And that's it. That's good. Okay. Almost all these studies, because of the Florida studies, showed no things, no mortality. Mm -hmm. Despite improvement in non moving ventilation and open what Why do you think? I mean, some of that could be the population that they were studying. A lot of those were the um, were COVID 19 patients. I think these were back in like 2020. Um, that was when the we had really, really bad COVID, so it could be that. Um, what is? So dumb. Could it be the question? Why <laughs> 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 there's no mortality, like, there's not show mortality is benefit, despite that there's a better oxygenation, better less rate of incubation, less, less time in the hospital, um, why there's no mortality benefit? I'm not sure what the criteria of that patient in my flow may be less sick than the other patients. Yeah, but at least you have many, many studies. And I think each study, if you look at the end, you have six or seven studies that you at least you brought up. Only the Florida study showed some mortality benefit in 60 or 90, mm -hmm. you know. But not in the short term. But not in the short term. So all of other studies <coughs> consistently showed no mortality benefit. Mm -hmm. now, definitely there will be some heterogeneity here and there, but these studies are usually well done, so to try to get the same mm -hmm. to compare them. So what, what do you think is going on? So why, I mean, who cares if the patient is not going to survive? So why should I make my, myself uh, do the headache and go through this calculation and stuff? Uh, in the end, you want a viable patient. Uh, and to my knowledge, all the patient non hypertension. Only hypoxia. Mm -hmm. so, uh, very simple, uh, very simple. Uh, because the number, the oxygenation exchange is not something which decide in the end if you can have the airport and that. Yeah. And the, the main point. focus is just on one shot on the patient. So the patient is not lungs, only lungs go. There is a heart, kidney, the brain, many things, many other things. So it shows, actually, this is, these studies are showing, despite no mortality benefit, mm -hmm. showing something important, that the oxygenation alone is not going to kill you if you are dead. If you have good lungs, a good heart, good kidneys, good liver, good everything, having hypoxemia for a short period of time will not kill you. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Like in the ARDS trials when they are yeah, exactly. looking at the peeve, how the peeve like improve. Like the high peeve improve oxygenation for sure, but, but it's not showing any mortality benefits, right? Despite that's a pretty good oxygenation. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. We can, as a human so, being, we then have to be involved. So, so, so you mean you mean improving improving the numbers will not affect 